Okay, I'd like to introduce you to Abba Shapiro. He is a professional photographer and he also co-directs this Skylum education team. Abba is our main presenter, so you get a real treat getting to listen to him tonight. And so what he will do again is he will be showing you Luminar 3. I hope that you enjoy it. So sit back, relax. And Abba, thanks for the presentation. We look forward to it. Well, thank you very much for that introduction, Laurie, and thank you everybody for joining us this evening on uh, your user group and listening to me talk about Luminar. And what I'm going to do tonight is walk you through uh, Luminar 3 and the library interface, show you how you can uh, attach your images to the library, how you can attach folders, how you can rate your images, how you can do favorites and reject images, as well as label them and organize them. And then once you've done that, show you how you can use the power of Luminar to quickly develop and enhance your image and then export them in a variety of formats. So to get started, this is the basic Luminar interface. This is the library view. And I just want to walk you around the interface. I'm switching over. Actually, I was on the info view looking at some of these images. But I have a variety of images here that I can look at in several sizes. So depending on the resolution of your monitor, you may want to look at larger images or smaller images. And it's very easy to do at the top of the interface. You can toggle between different sizes. So that's really nice. But let's go ahead and bring in some additional images and show you how you can attach folders of images to your library. So I've created a basic library. You can have multiple libraries. I'll use the term library and catalog pretty interchangeably with Luminar. And so it's technically a catalog. However, uh, we'll use the term library and you can have multiple libraries. So you don't necessarily have to put all of your images in one giant library. Sometimes you may want to organize them by event. You may want to organize your uh, images by client. Maybe you have family images in one catalog and you have your work images in another catalog. So you can have as many catalogs as you need. The nice thing is these catalogs don't take up a lot of space because the images that you work with aren't moved into the catalog, they remain where they are on your hard drive. So you don't have that redundancy and you don't have that catalog bloat. So let's talk about how you can attach images to your catalog. If you look over at the right side of the interface, you'll see there's a library panel and there's several different areas to that. And I'm gonna to point to the area called folders. So if I wanted to add a card of images or a folder of images, to my catalog, all I need to do is hit the plus button. It'll open up Explorer or the Finder for me. And then I can navigate to where I might have some images. And I have these folders organized a couple of different ways so you can see how the catalog or library system works. I have one folder labeled Travel Photos, which everything is just in the folder, uh, just on a flat level. The other folder that I have to work with is called Travel Photos, and I have pre-organized my media, or my media has been organized basically into the different places that I went, so there are subfolders. And I could even have folders within these folders if I wanted to. And the nice thing is, is that Luminar will respect the structure of these folders when I bring it in, so I don't have to reorganize everything. So I can take advantage of the organization that I already have in place. When I click on a folder, and I'll do the travel portraits first, I go and press add folder in the bottom right hand corner. Luminar will take a look at all of these images. It will pull the JPEG to create a thumbnail if it's a raw file or use the JPEGs. You'll notice how quickly this populated. And one of the things we did when we designed Luminar is we wanted it to be really responsive. We didn't want you to have that lag of, oh, now I have to wait 15 minutes to import my photos. Because what Luminar has done, it's left the photos in their location, but it's cataloged them and very quickly created these thumbnails that I can work with. I'm going to bring in, that was just 44 images. These are all camera raw. I want to attach another folder, and this has a lot more images, and they're a mix of TIFF files and PICT files, JPEGs, 
the original raw files from a variety of cameras, as well as some digital negatives and DNG files. And Luminar can work with all of these, including PNG files, as well as uh, Photoshop documents, PSD files. So I'm going to add all of these images. I'll say add folder. And I just added, it looks like 200 images. So you saw how quickly that populated. And I can look at this in a variety of ways. Again, small, medium, and large. And if I go over to the right-hand side, you'll notice there's a triangle next to the word travel photos. And if I click on that to disclose the contents, I have all of the organization that I had before. As a matter of fact, you'll notice one of these miscellaneous to organize is grayed out. And that's because there was nothing in the folder, but it respected the fact that there was a folder there. And this is important because one of the things you can do with Luminar 3 is you can use Luminar to organize things on your hard drive. You can use it to organize it whether you're on a Mac or a PC. We work on both platforms. And if I've already attached this master folder to Luminar, even this miscellaneous one to organize, I'm going to go ahead and hide the application, dig down to where this folder is. So that was travel photos. And there were eight items here. And if I look at miscellaneous to organize, uh, I think that was the one that didn't have anything in it. I think these are empty. And if I threw an image in there, and I'm going to grab an image from this quick edit these folders. And if I drag, say, for instance, this tiger here, I'm going to copy it. I'm going to hold down the I'm on a Mac, so I'm going to hold down the option key. That's going to make a copy of it because I just want to keep this first folder in a pristine state. But I could drop anything in here. And when anything is dropped into a location that Luminar is looking at, it will automatically update. So if you notice miscellaneous to organize, when I click on that, that tiger image is there. So the nice thing here is, I can point to my media folder or my photography folder. And as I add new images or new folders of images to that folder, if this catalog is pointing to it, then it will automatically populate and organize. So that's really nice. As a matter of fact, if I hit the disclosure triangle down here, you can see I have these empty folders that had I put something in there, it would populate. So it's really great for organizing your media. And on the flip side, I can also organize my media that's on my hard drive from within Luminar. So for instance, if I wanted to, I could say, you know what? I think this tiger was actually photographed when I was walking the streets of Paris. So I can grab that and drag it and drop it into the Paris folder. And it's going to physically relocate it on my hard drive. So if I go here under Paris, there is the tiger. And if I right click on this and say, show in the finder, I will see that it's inside that Paris folder. And that's really kind of a, a nice feature that I can additionally organize things from within Luminar. And it's great because I can see my images. And that's one of the challenges sometimes when you're working with a lot of photos and organizing them and you're going through the operating system, sometimes opening and closing and figuring out where they go can be really a tedious uh, effort. So I wanted to point that out. So you can physically move things. Another thing that you can do, because maybe you don't want to physically move these, but you want to organize them, is you can create what are called albums. And think of an album as kind of a playlist that you would use for a music library. For instance, you could have a song by John Lennon, and it could be in multiple uh, playlists. One song, one image is the analogy, and it could be under Beatles, it could be under music from the 60s, it could be under John Lennon, and you could look at it in multiple locations, even though it's in one. So if I wanted to create, say, an album, I could choose all the people shots, and I'm just going to click to select these and hold down the command key on a Mac the control key on Windows, select all the images that I have with people in it. And I'm doing this pretty quickly. I'll scroll down. I've got some more people there. These are pretty much scenic stuff, some more people there. And once I select these, I can click on add an album. It's going to put them in an album. I'll label this people. And none of these have been physically moved, but I can find them quickly. And if I jump back over 
to my Paris imagery, and I might have a few more at the bottom with people. There we go. And I can either just drag them on top there, and now it's added to that album. I thought I had some people down here. So I can organize things initially by selecting them and putting them into an album or adding them later. And these images can be in a different album if I wanted to. If I wanted to, I could go back to Paris and I could just do all, you know, wide shots of people. Sorry, I just hit the space bar. There we go. Select that and maybe select just some more, you know, people shots here and now make another new album. And, and I'm going to pick even ones that I've chosen. And I can click on the plus next to the word album. And in this case, I'll call these favorites, perhaps. Other one way to do it. So I have the same image in multiple places. So it's just easy to find things. And that's what's really nice about the organizational structure. So that's the first thing I wanted to show you. Now let's jump back to all the photos and talk about how I might be able to rate and organize these. Let's switch over actually to the travel portraits because these are all very similar images. The attempt was I wanted to get the right emotion as this woman was walking down the streets of Puerto Rico. It wasn't a random person, I knew it, so it wasn't like capturing somebody, but I was trying to make sure that there weren't people in the background and the framing was right. So now that I have all of these images, I wanna go ahead and sort them. And it's very easy to do, and I can use a lot of the same keyboard shortcuts that I would use if I was using Lightroom. And I know a lot of people in your group do use Lightroom as one of their processing and organizational tools. So. I can add or select my picks by right clicking and setting a different flag on these. I can go, is it a favorite? Keyboard shortcut P as a pick. Is it rejected? The universal cross out or an X, or I can unmark it. So I can do it with a right click, but it's much more efficient to use these keyboard shortcuts. So I can go through and say, make them largest so I can really see them. And I can say, oh, not really that great, X. This next one, X. This is maybe an X, but I like this one, so it's a pick. I'm hitting the P key. You'll notice that I have a little thing here that indicates if it's rejected or selected. And if it's rejected, it's actually dimmed out. I can also, if I just wanna see my favorites, click on this little heart here, and that will make it a favorite. So I can very quickly cull through my images and find the ones that I like. I kinda of like these really, so I'm gonna mark these. As a matter of fact, I could mark these as favorites, but another thing I could do is rate my images on a scale of one to five. And you saw when I right clicked earlier that there's a set rating option. Once again, I could do it by right clicking it, but obviously it's a lot more efficient to use the numerics of are the numbers one through five. So I could go here and I think that's like a three. <clears throat> Give this a four. No, that's a two. See, I can change it. This one's getting close, it's a three. I have these that I really like. I'm gonna just give them fives right off the bat. Very easy to do if I wanted to and not use my keyboard. If you look at this image here, there's a shadow of five stars on the left. I can click on any one of those to also mark it. So the idea behind this is whatever style you like to use, whether it's right clicking, whether it's a drop down menu, because you can also do it from the main menu, whether it's clicking on an image, or using a keyboard shortcut, you can work the way that you're used to and the way that you like. So now that I've rated a bunch of these images, maybe I wanted to sort them. And I'm gonna just do a quick look. And this is another great feature. If I wanted to, I don't even have to use my mouse. I can use the left and right arrow keys and then either mark things as a favorite or mark them with a star rating, as well as I can, if you're used to using this in Lightroom, set a color label and it's the same keyboard shortcuts six seven eight and nine for the main ones that you're used to purple won't have one you click on it and you can easily rate an image so if i said this is red for some reason and maybe i'm grouping these for any number of reasons maybe it's people might be red travel logs with just uh buildings could be a different color it could be yellow it could be seven and you'll notice that i'll be able to see that very easily when I rate these images. So I'll give these a red. And I'm just doing this arbitrarily for, you know, because these are all very similar, but it does have some method to my madness as I go through here. I like this one, six, and I'm also gonna get a five stars. 
So I can do that by moving my mouse, but I can also just use the left and right arrow keys to step through my images. If I wanted to, I could do the same thing with these full frame. And all I did was double click on the image, and now it's full frame. I see this area at the bottom. I don't want to focus on that yet. I'm going to turn it off. That's our looks, and that's something you can use to quickly develop an image. And it's very easy to turn it off. There's lots of icons on the top toolbar. I'm just clicking on this one. It right now hides that so it's not a distraction. I'm not using it. And I can go through now that this is full screen. And once again, as I step through, I can use my keyboard shortcuts. I can also click directly on this. If you notice, I have these underneath. And if you aren't seeing these when you're using the application yourself, it's something that you activate or turn on in this upper toolbar. Um, if I click over here, I clicked on the wrong one. Sorry about that. It was a little hasty. But if I click on this right in the center, right next to that area that I just turned off, I can choose to see a variety of views of my images. So in this case, side panel is checked. That's the section to the right of my image. And I'm going to move this over here a little bit to the left because I want to make sure you see everything on your TV. Let's see. There we go. That's perfectly centered. The other options I have is I can show photo actions. And that's what I'm seeing now. So if I unclick that, you don't see that at the bottom. And if I click it, I do. So again, stylistically, however you want to work. If I want to see a little film strip on the side to see where I am, but I don't want to necessarily look at this as a grid, I can click on film strip and I can once again see, you know, all the variety of images. And it's not a great variety here, but now I can quickly step through and with my right and left arrow keys, see the image, see if it's sharp, see her expression, and then I can rate it and I can even click on it once. I'm sorry, double click on it. And that will zoom me into 100% so I can see, was it sharp? Is the contrast there? Very nice. And a lot of the keyboard shortcuts, once again, you may have learned when using Lightroom, you can use here. So Control-1 or Command-1 will enlarge the image to 100%. And Control or Command-0, depending on whether you're a Mac or a PC, will take you back to a fit-to-screen option. And of course, if you just like to click, there's a drop down menu that can do that. So that's a nice way to very quickly organize my images. I'm going to go through, I want to see which expression I like the best. And, you know, if she did it over, I like this one actually. I love this one. I'm going to give this a five. I'm going to make it red. I don't think there's any other ways I can mark this other than five red. Oh, yeah, I can give it a heart. So this says I love this image and I'm going to work with it. As a matter of fact, we may work with this in the webinar. So now I'm going to jump back to my gallery view or my grid view. And I use that specifically those terms because they both start with G and the keyboard shortcut to get back to this view is the G key as in grid or gallery. Or I could click this little button up here. And now I can go back and show this instead of the largest. We'll switch it to small so I can see all my images. And I'm ready to take advantage of this rating and labeling that I just did. If you look in the upper right hand corner of the interface, under showing, there are several options. I can say, you know what, just show me the ones I've marked as my favorites. And that quickly moves everything out of the way. And there I see my favorites. As a matter of fact, in addition to that, I also see their star ratings. I'm going to uh, keep that for a second and then just jump over here to the next side, which says organize by capture time. And if I click on that drop down menu, I can choose how I want to sort the viewed images, the ones that I'm seeing, by a variety of options. I can say show it to me by color label or by the file name if it's alphabetical or the type of file if I have a mix of TIFF files and RAW files and JPEGs. In my case, I want to sort them by rating. I want to see which ones were the best. So I click on rating and there we go. We have two, three, four, and then all the fives. I can do that in an ascending or a descending option. So I can do it descending. So all my fives are at the top. Very easy to organize. I could go back instead of sorting these by favorites. I could say, you know what? Show me anything that I marked red and then sort them by rating. So once I've organized or culled, culled these, it's very easy to refine what I'm looking at. And that's really nice. So maybe I just want to see the ones three stars or more. I don't care whether they're rated as a pick or not. And what's great here is I can select all of these by either clicking them all individually and holding down the command of the control key or just do a select all. 
and that would be Control A or Command A. And then go over here to my albums. I'm gonna make an albums of my selects. I click plus and I go selects. And now I can very quickly go back and find these later on if I want. As a matter of fact, if I open up all of my images, I'm gonna go back here under travel portraits, look at everything, and maybe I just wanna eyeball them. I could say, you know what? Maybe this one is one I really like. And I'm going to just drag that right onto selects and maybe even drag it on to people because I also say it's a people thing. So there it is in my people library. And this is now in my select site library. So organizing things is very quick and very efficient. And just to reiterate, anything in an album is not moved on your hard drive. Anything that's in a folder, if you start moving things around, you actually have the opportunity to reorganize images you might have in those locations. So it's a very quick way to find them within Explorer or within the Finder. Other things that I have, if I look at the top, if I click on all photos, and depending on what library I have selected or if I have all of them selected, I can search by date and say, oh yeah, what did I shoot on March 16th on the 21st? And I have this image right here. Conversely, if I'm in all of my photos, which I can organize a variety of ways, I can still sort this by rating or favorites, but maybe I wanna find everything I shot on this one day. And instead of having to figure out what day it was and go over to the shortcuts on the right, I can simply right click on it and I can say, go to images, from the same date. And it will find all of the images that I shot on this day. And instead of looking at it by rating, I'm gonna look at it by capture time. And now these are all next to each other and I can quickly find what I need. So this is very powerful. I'm gonna close this so we can see a couple of other things. If I've recently added some images, it will show me. If I just wanna look at my favorites, which is very popular, I can do that. So I don't even have to go over here and change it. I can say, just show me anything I marked with a heart or with the keyboard shortcut of P. So this is a great way to work. There's two other ways that you can attach or bring images into your catalog. I'm gonna do that in the upper left-hand corner with this drop-down menu right here. And what we've done is we've added the folder. So this is yet another way to add a folder, but there's also two additional options, import images and open images for quick edit. And they work very differently. And the nice thing is, is it allows you to work in the style that you want to. Let's look at import images first. If I click on import images, what you have the option of is searching through your drives or to a card that you've copied. And if you select that, and I can go over here to Skylum Libraries and I have some images from Brazil and I can click on that. If I say import, I have some options on how Luminar is going to work with those images. So the first thing I can choose is where do I want them to go? Do I want them to go into what folder? Okay, so I can move it into quick edit these or maybe I wanna move it into miscellaneous to organize. The next choice, and this is the critical one, is do I want to physically move the original media because I wanna organize it on my hard drive or do I wanna keep it where it is but copy those images so that the original stays in maybe my backup media folder, but I want it local. I'm gonna copy it for now. And then when I copy them, I can choose when it puts it inside that miscellaneous to organize, if I want it to put it into subfolders. And if those subfolders can be by year and month, year, month, and day, keep the original structure or just move everything into the top level, which is actually what I wanna do. And they were all actually done on the same day. So it's kind of a moot point. And the button here down here that says include subfolders, what that means is if I chose a folder up here that had even more subfolders in it, it would look into those deeper folders. If I don't have this checked, it will just look at the top level. So it's nice if you have a folder with lots of images and you don't want it to open up everything because there's so many, you can choose to check or uncheck that. And then I can say import into folder. Remember I'm making a copy and it will physically make a copy into my miscellaneous to organize it that really quickly. And there it is at that top level. And I have these five bracketed images that I've made a copy of into this folder. So if I say show in finder and I look inside that folder, there we go. 
there's a copy of my images. So that's a second way that you might want to work with images. The third way is there's often times where you want to be able to just process a bunch of images. You know, somebody gave you some things to fix and you don't really want to bring them into a catalog. It's only for a quick turnaround. And what you can do is open images for quick edit. Now, what this does is it doesn't move the original images. It points to them just like a folder, but it's kind of earmarked that it's temporary. So they're very easy to remove. So if I grab this sunset picture and I say open in quick edit, what it will do is it opens this in a separate category. If I click over to library, you see there's something called quick edit. And I can process this and export it. And then when I'm done, all I need to do is click on it and say remove from quick edit. So it's not necessarily brought into my library. Nothing is moved. Think of it as a temporary holding area. Now, if I decide to keep it, I can always take that image. And I'm going to step to the library level and drag that image and uh, drop that image into maybe one of my existing folders, in which case it's going to move that image into that folder and I can keep it there. And you notice I can go back here to quick edit. So normally I wouldn't do that. I just want to point out you can, but when I'm done processing that image, all I have to do is say remove from quick edits. It's gone. As a matter of fact, since there's nothing else in quick edit and I could bring in a whole folder of images into quick edit, process them. And then when I'm done, just right click and say remove from quick edit. So that's a great way to work. So that's in general, one of the ways that I would work with these images to organize and cull them and very quickly be able to work with them. Now I'm ready to start processing an image. Let me go over here and I kind of like what we're working with. So I'm going to choose my five stars that will narrow it down. I'm going to make this nice and big so I can pick the one that I want. As a matter of fact, I'm even going to double click and just use my arrow keys and step through them. I like them. I think this is the best expression. I think I really like the way that she's kind of looking uh, in awe at the really cool colors. This was a lot brighter. This really popped to me when I was there shooting this. But there's a couple things I want to change. First of all, I don't need that beer bottle there. Not. I actually had never noticed that before because I've always cropped it out. And I don't need this person here. As a matter of fact, I'll probably make this into an Instagram image and I want it to be square. So the first thing I might do before I do any processing is change it so that I'm not distracted by things that I'm not going to see. So I can go over to the tools menu and go into crop and I get my cropping tool. Now, the nice thing about the cropping tool is by default, it's locked to the aspect ratio of the image. But if I want, I can click on this little lock. That gives me the opportunity to do any kind of free cropping I want. Or I can go under aspect ratio and choose some predefined crops. So if I'm going to say uh, television, I want that to be 16 by 9. That's the aspect ratio of high definition television. If I need to put out an 8 by 10, I could choose an 8 by 10 cropping and figure that out. Or in my case, I can go directly to square. Another feature I really like that I probably won't show because of lack of time is if I want to put something on my Facebook cover, I click on that and now I have the perfect aspect ratio for the Facebook cover. This person still is here, but I can remove them because we have both a clone and stamp tool and an erase tool built into the application. But as I said, I want it to be square. If I don't, this is smaller, so I could go ahead and change that or always just hit reset and now go to square and I'm using pretty much the whole frame and I'm going to tweak this to the rule of thirds, position it so that she's, you know, kind of right there. I'll make it a little bit bigger just to kind of give us some context and I like this so I'm going to hit done. And now I don't have to worry about the beer bottle. I don't have to worry about um, the person. I do want to fix one thing here. It's a little bit crooked. Part of this is the perception from the aspect ratio. If I wanted to, when I edited this, and I'm going to switch over from the library tool to the edit tool, brings up uh, a slightly different interface that we will look at. And when I'm in the edit tool, I can straighten this out by putting on a develop module. And I'll explore this in a moment. So I can click on add a develop module. And under the develop module, there's lens correction as well as transform. So I could rotate this a little bit there and scale it up if I wanted to, but that's kind of straight. And the other way that I could have done this, and I'm going to leave this in place actually, is I could have gone into my cropping tool 
And in the cropping tool, in addition to the crop, there's also an angle viewer. So there's a couple of ways to do everything. And the nice thing is depending on your style. So this isn't as distracting. So let's talk about how I could process this image. First of all, I'm in the edit side in the second panel here. I'm gonna close this so I can walk you through the interface. When I'm looking at this, I want this to be as large as possible. I no longer need this film strip on the left side, but it's nice if I'm doing a lot of edits that I can quickly jump between some of my images. So it's a nice feature. I'm not using it now, so I'll turn that off. And I know this is super well rated, so I'm going to even turn off my current photo actions so I'm using as much real estate as possible. Now, there are several ways you can attack developing a photo. If you want, you can go ahead and take advantage of our looks. And I'm gonna turn those on again. I'll click on looks and you'll see there's a film strip or a bunch of thumbnails on this panel on the bottom. Now, when I click on a look and I can see a thumbnail of what each of these looks will make my, how they will modify my image. But when I click on it, take a look at what happens on the right side in that right panel. When you apply a look, it applies several different filters with adjustments already made that will create that look. So this is just an image enhancer. It takes advantage of the raw develop tool, our Accent AI filter, which is a great global correction tool as well as the sky enhancer. Um, I can try a classic black and white. I can go with enhancing the contrast. A lot of presets, maybe I wanna go super sharp or soft and airy. But the cool thing is, is that when I apply a filter, I can always blend it back with the original image if I think it's doing too much. If I go over here to portrait enhancer and I think it's doing too much, I can dial it back from 100 to zero. Even the black and white, I can blend it in to give it a hint of color. But let's take that to the next level. I'm gonna go back to the AI image enhancer because not only can I blend this back to the with the original image, if you look here on the right, these are the four filters that were used to create this look. And all of the sliders are adjustable once I've applied this look. So maybe I think this has done a good job, but I wanna tweak it a little bit. Maybe I want to open up my highlights a little bit, open up my shadows a little bit to brighten it up, maybe bring down the blacks or the clarity. The point is I'm not locked in. I can use looks as a finishing tool just to quickly process an image, or I can use it for detailed enhancement to an image where I say, okay, I like where it's starting, but I'm now going to tweak it to my preference. And not only do I have the ability to work with the four filters in this case that have been applied for this look, but if I wanna add my own filter to enhance this look, I can very easily do that by clicking on the add filter button on the right side. And once I do that, it opens up all of the filters that are available to you in Luminar. There's over 50 filters, and we've broken them up into a variety of uh, subject areas or styles of, of, of developing. We have our essential filters, things such as a black and white conversion filter. We have the develop filter, which I've already applied. You can add structure and toning and a vignette. I'm gonna add a vignette here and just bring that vignette a little bit down to focus on her, add a little bit of inner light, maybe the size. And now I'm gonna place it over her because that's where I want the vignette to focus my eyes or the viewer's eyes. So I'm very easy to add these. If I wanted to, I could scroll through and say, now I wanna stylize it a little bit. So maybe I'll add a little bit of a soft glow. And whenever you apply a filter, it always comes in neutral with no effect applied. So I need to move the slider over to increase the amount. Maybe I wanna add a little bit more brightness to make that pop and warm it up a little bit. If I like it, great. If I don't like it, I can easily reset it. I can also turn it on and off with this little eyeball here to the right. So I can see what this filter has done. And if I hate it, I can simply remove it by clicking on the X key and keep moving forward and try other filters. So that's the nice thing about it is I can use looks to start 
and then continue to edit by adding any of these filters. And I pointed out they are broken into categories. The essential ones you use, maybe you need to fix some problems. That could be removing noise in darker areas. Maybe there's haze, it was an overcast day. I can also enhance the details if I want to really bring things up. As a matter of fact, if I wanted to enhance the details, I like the texture on this building, I want it to really pop, I can click on the Details Enhancer, and I'm going to zoom into 100%, and we'll go ahead here, and I'll bring my details up of just the small details and the medium ones, and you're starting to see that great texture on the wall. And I don't even need to bring the large ones up. So this is great for the wall, but not great for her skin. And this is where another really nice feature comes into play. And that is every single filter has the ability to be masked. So I can brush the filter in or out. I can use a radial mask to create a circle, or I can use a gradient mask, which is great if I'm doing something with sky and ground, if I wanna go ahead and bring in details on the ground, but not necessarily on the sky. I'm gonna use the brush tool. And when I click on that, you'll notice it turns yellow. As a matter of fact, an indicator that a filter has been modified is that it is yellow. If I had brought a filter in that I didn't modify, it would just be white. So it's very easy to see what's been modified. But now that I've clicked on this brush and made it turn yellow, you'll notice in the upper left-hand corner that I now have some different things in my top toolbar. One is a paint option, the other is an erase option. So right now, if it's in paint, I can paint this detail enhancer in wherever I want it. I'm gonna drop back to 100, uh, to fit to window, I'm gonna hit Control Zero or Command Zero. And I like the detail in most of this, so I can paint this in. And you'll notice as soon as I start painting, the areas that I haven't painted yet will go back to normal. So now everything is a little bit softer, but I'm painting in the detail on the walls painting in the detail on the ground. I'm doing kind of a quick and sloppy job, but I will zoom in and you can see, and actually I just painted over her and this is kind of nice. It's an intended yet unintended accident. I can show a ruby lith or an overlay of where that filter exists or what I'm actually, in this case, adding detail to. So obviously I added detail to part of her that I don't want to. I can switch over here to erase and remove that and even refine how close I get in to her skin. And if I go and I press Control-1 or Command-1, I can zoom into 100%, so I can be a little more fine-tuned. Now, this brush is easy to change its size. It's the same keyboard shortcut that you would use in Lightroom. So it's just the left bracket key and the right bracket key to make it larger and smaller. And if you hold down the Shift key, you can actually make it softer or harder. If you really like to use your drop-down windows, you can go up here, click on size, softness, as well as the opacity, if you want some translucence to the way that this filter is going to affect what I've marked in. So I'm gonna turn off the ruby lith. And if I toggle the effect on and off, you can see that that sharpness is only being added to the wall. I'm gonna accentuate that a little bit, but not necessarily to her skin. And let me just zoom out here. And you can see, I'll turn off this overlay. So there it is with and without. If we're at 100%, let's go right here. You'll notice, oh, double click that in the wrong way. There we go. We're back here. Bring this to 100%, move it over. And oh, my mouse is being kind of uh, a little bit fidgety. So we'll just leave me zoomed in there, but I wanna turn on and off the detail enhancer and take a look how it affects the wall, but not her skin. So that's really a very nice feature. So I can go ahead, I wanna add a little more vibrance to this. I'm gonna add this filter. Oh, there's saturation and vibrance. I really want it to pop. I'm gonna bring that up a little bit. Vibrance I really like because it's smart saturation. When you move vibrance to the right, it only adds saturation to the more muted colors and not the more saturated colors, which is nice. It kind of evens out the image where saturation is just like a global slider. So, you know, I like the fact I can work with vibrance. It's making this really pop, really colorful. I'm gonna add just one more filter, the tone filter, because I wanna bring out the luminance on this green dress. And the tone filter has this great option. Oh, I turned off my detail enhancer. You notice when it's turned off, it's grayed out. So let me turn that back on. And since I haven't marked the tone area at all, uh, it stills white, as I indicated before. 
But I'm going to use smart turning. What I like about smart turning is if I move this slider to the left, I can recover highlights without affecting my shadows and crushing them. Or if I move it to the left, I can, I'm sorry, move it from the left to the right, open up my shadows without blowing out my highlights. So I'm going to open this up a little bit. It brightens up the green dress. This is really kind of nice. I did reset my straightening. So I'm going to go back here. I'll straighten it using the crop tool. So my crop is still here, but I'm going to go ahead and grab this angle and just tweak this a little bit so that building is straight. There we go. And hit done. So now I have this image. I'm really happy with it. And I want to point out a couple of other features that are available. I can at this point, and by the way, um, anytime you add a filter, it's always added to the bottom. Sometimes it benefits you to relocate it to a different part. Maybe I always like my vignette to be at the end of my workflow. So I can reorganize any filter by simply grabbing it in the middle and dragging it up or down in that workflow. And now the vignette happens at the very end of my workflow. And I can, again, tweak it if I want a little more aggressive vignette there. So I'm really happy with this. Now I'm ready to export it. So if I want to export this image, and these are all in my library, I go up to the upper right, one of a couple of places that you can export an image, and I can choose to export that. You'll notice there's some other options here. I can actually go directly to my email program if I want, or messages, or in this case to SmugMug. I can also open it in other applications. I can send this to Photoshop. I can send it to Lightroom. If I'm on a Mac, I can send it to Photos. I know some of you are using Aperture, so I can send it to Aperture. And it will create a uh, TIFF file that will be opened in that other application. But for now, I want to export this as just an image. And I see my options here when I click on Export. I can choose the location where I want to put it. I'm going to move it right to my desktop, easy to find after the webinar. And then I can choose when I export it if I want to change the size. As a matter of fact, earlier today I was making a new icon and I needed an image that was just 200 pixels wide. A little bit small to print, I would say. But I can choose the original size, which is, of course, you know, 3,000 by 3,500 3, by 3,500. It's a square. Or I could change it and say, you know what, I want this to be exactly 2,000 pixels wide for my long edge because that's what I want to post because I don't want to necessarily put up the full resolution of the image. I can also choose what flavor of image I want to do. Now, right now it's under JPEG, so I can choose how compressed that JPEG is. But if I switch over to, say, one of these other options, and these are the different formats that you can export to, I can say, well, let's do it as a TIFF because I'm going to be sending this out to a printer. And then I can choose if I want to compress it. Maybe I don't want any compression at all. I can choose whether it's 8 or 16 bits, so I don't have to worry at 16 bits if there's any banding and also pixel resolution. So, for instance, I know I want to print this, so I'll set it to 240. And now that I've done that, and I think I need to, I, I open this up full screen so I can't see the accept button, but if I hit accept, uh, it will send that picture, it'll process the image and send it out, which I just did. And then it marinates everything and applies all of the effects and it will show up on my desktop as an image and it's processing all of this stuff. If I want to find it, I simply go hide and there it is as a TIFF file and it's all done, or maybe it's not. Another nice thing that you have here is the ability to continually edit your images or go back in time. Of course you can undo, and that would be Command Z or Control Z on your system, but you can also step back through the entire history of everything you might have done to an image. So maybe you made a mistake, you might have removed something or put something strange on. You can go back and see what you've done, or maybe you've played with a bunch of options and you're like, oh my God, I really ruined everything. I just wanna go back to an earlier state. The nice thing is if I quit Luminar and open up an hour later, a week later, or six months later, this history is still retained all the way back to the original image. And that's really a nice feature. The other thing that's really nice is maybe I like the way this is processed, but now I want to try a couple of different styles, a couple of different looks. And we have a variety of looks that ship with the application. These first seven looks are bundled when you install it. And then if you go to our website, we have a whole slew of looks that you can add. As a matter of fact, even if you go to the very bottom of this collections catalog, you can click on get more Luminar looks. It'll take you directly to that page. 
And most of our looks are free. We do have some that we sell. Some photographers have designed their specific looks for us and they do sell those looks. So if you want to have a photographer that you like their style and you want to just be able to get to that with one click, those are available. But pretty much I think all the ones that I have on here are the free ones that you can download. And this is great because it allows you to try different things. So perhaps I want to stylize this and I'm going to just pick one of the default ones. Maybe I'll go to dramatic or let's go to lifestyle. And you'll notice that along the bottom that these thumbnails have changed and the names have changed, but before I click to apply, and I'm gonna make this mistake because you will make this mistake, and I wanna show you that you can save yourself. When you apply a look, it automatically will apply all of the filters to create that look, and if I do it right now, it's going to replace all of this work that I did. It's just how it's designed. So if I click on fashionable, it'll go, oh yeah, and it just replaced this with a whole slew of different looks that aren't what I want to do. And then I go, oh, I'll do flaw fixers. And then I'll go dark moon and I get these looks. And it's like, wait a second, I messed it up. And that's where that history is great. Look at that. These are the looks. I can go right back here. And the history remembers every look you applied, every filter you added, every slider you adjusted. So we'll go back to vignette amount and I'll show you a better way to do this. I've developed this picture the way I want to, and now I want to tweak it. I can add as many layers to this image as I want. And these layers can be adjustment layers, which is what we've been using and what we'll continue to use. But I could add another image on top. I could add a texture and blend that in. I could add clouds to an image in a sky that doesn't have clouds and blend that in. So it's nice that I have that flexibility. I'm going to add a new adjustment layer. And when I add an adjustment layer, now if I apply any of these effects, such as beautiful sunset, it applies it to the image, which I can then tweak again using my slider, 0 to 100. Or I can add elements. I like it, but maybe I don't want to use golden hour as much and dial that back and dial back, maybe just turn off brilliance and warmth. And even though I've done this, I can turn it on and off with the little eyeball, just like you can with a filter. And everything I've done to the previous layer, if I click on it, remains intact. So I have this adjustment layer that I can use to try out looks, or perhaps what I want to do is just take advantage of the style here and maybe blend it in or paint it in with either a brush or a radial mask. So maybe I'll do a radial mask, never have done this with this image and I can change the shape, and this is the, the mask, and this is the, the softness of the mask. So I'm putting that over her and just play with that a little bit. There is my ruby lith if I wanted to, and if I wanted to, I can also invert the mask. So stylistically, I can create uh, a different look and focus it. So the point is every filter has the ability to have a mask, and every adjustment layer can have a mask. In addition to that, Every filter and every adjustment layer also has built-in blending modes. So I can do a blending mode with any of my filters, okay? And this is the area here. Let me turn off this mask point that I have here because I don't want to blow up my system. And I can say, you know what? I want to blend something in. Oh, I turn that off, so we'll go with golden hour. And all I have to do is hover over. I can see what that blend mode looks like without having to click or apply it. So it's really nice. I can apply blend modes to filters or to layers. It just gives you that much more power, especially if you've been using, say, uh, the version of Lightroom that you own, you're using Lightroom 6, which some people I know aren't subscribing to the cloud. It adds so many more features that enhance what you already have. So that's a nice thing. And once again, I can export this. I wanna show you just one other couple more features. Uh, and then we'll open it up to Lori and some questions. I want to point out here an example of clone and stamp. So I find this distracting. I don't necessarily want that in my image. So what I can do is with this image selected, I can switch over. And did I open up the right stamp? Yes, I did. I am going to click on Tools and choose Clone and Stamp. It now opens up my clone and stamp tool, and then I can choose what area of my image I want to work on. And I'm going to just clone from over here. So we'll say that's my starting point. And I'm going to make this a little bit smaller. 
and just paint right over and remove this from here. Did that pretty easily. If you weren't looking, it's pretty transparent. Sometimes I like to actually choose a couple of areas and remove my opacity just to blend things in. But I think that's pretty spot on. And now that I've done that, I click on done. It will process that, put that in on a new layer. And I've completely done my image. Give it a second to do what it's gonna do. And there we have our final image. And I can look at my previous one in the upper right part of the toolbar. That's my before. That's what I brought in. That's my after. I can also look at this side by side. There we go. The last thing I want to show, and I know I've kind of gone a little longer than I promised, but I'm pretty excited about what I've shown you, is I'm going to go up here to uh, all of my photos. I want to find one specifically, and I think it's under miscellaneous to organize. I want to show everything. And where was it? It wasn't under travel. Quick edit these. I think I had a nice one. I want to show this as an example because I didn't really explain the accent AI filter. And let me close the, uh, the look so this is nice and full screen. So this is an image out of the camera and the sky's a little bit off and the image could pop a little bit. So I'm going to jump over to the edit mode and I'm not going to use a look. Now, when I'm in the edit mode, I have a choice to open this up as a clear workspace with nothing there, and I can bring things in one at a time, filters I would use, but we also have preset workspaces, and depending on the type of image you're working on, you can choose that, and it will bring in specific filters without any adjustments that you would likely use for th that type of work. These can be customized. You can make your own workspaces and save them as a new workspace, and even save it as a default for when you open it up. I'm gonna go over here to Quick and Awesome, because it has a couple of filters that are unique and incredibly powerful. One is the Accent AI filter. And what we did with the Accent AI filter is we did a lot of machine learning and artificial intelligence where we took thousands and thousands, over tens of thousands of images that were hand processed, put the before and afters through uh, a computer and saw how a photographer would develop those images. And then we use what it learned to quickly be able to use one slider that examines the image, finds sky, finds foreground, finds detail. And with one slider, it adjusts the tone and contrast of the image and the color. And I can, with one slider, make this image really start to pop. So there we have the before and the after with my Accent AI filter. I can dial that in. And we also have the AI Sky Enhancer filter. Same technology where we use machine learning and a lot of before and after and specifically found sky and create a mask. And when I move this to the right, it enhances the sky, gives it that kind of strong blue color in this case, but it doesn't affect the clouds and it doesn't make it all crunchy. As a matter of fact, it even recognized the sky behind this bridge here, I can toggle that off. You can see that when I toggle it on and off, that it, and I'm gonna make this a little more accentuated so you can really see, but it doesn't get confused. And also if I go full screen here, it doesn't affect the water. So it really understands sky and it's great because with a couple of sliders, and that's one of the beauties of Luminar, I can make a picture really pretty Okay, I really like what it's doing. I'm going to add a little bit of structure or detail to this just because I want the foreground to pop. I'm going to move the structure over. Don't like what it does to the clouds, but very easily click on mask. I'll do a gradient mask. Just bring it in here. So I'm only affecting uh, there. I, I, my, I can't get a job moving my mouse, but other than that, I'm pretty good. So this is backwards. Um, I can simply, I'm going to accept it because I can flip it. We'll go here, mask, invert. So now uh, I think the sky is not affected by my structure. It is, what have I done? Have I done this wrong? Or did I do something wrong with my mask? This is where enthusiasm, I'm gonna just make sure and, and erase it here. I can turn on the Ruby lift. Yeah, I completely boggled myself. So I'll make this nice and big, just paint out the sky very quickly all this editing inside of an hour. I'm gonna hit the X key, I can now paint that in, paint that out, there we go, turn that off. And now we get what we want, a lot more detail in the foreground without the clouds getting all banged up. And just to show you that the sky filter works not only with midday, but it works from blue hour to blue hour, I have this great little sunset, open that up, little accent AI boost, little sky enhancer enhances that sunset, 
We'll bring in a little vibrance, a little clarity. Here is my before, there is my after, and very quickly, I love it, I want more sky. I'm gonna click on this and duplicate it. Any of our filters can be duplicated. So now my sunset really pops, and I'm really happy with that. So that's a fast and furious walkthrough of Luminar 3. At this point, we're gonna open it up to Lori, who will show you a couple of uh, resources so this is where you'd go to get some more information. So under Luminar here, if you just click on that, we have Luminar 3 and we also have Luminar Flex plugin. Both of these, you can actually download a free trial, see if you like it, and you can purchase it. And I'll give you that code again so that you can get $10 off of Luminar 3 or Luminar Flex. And then part of the proceeds will go back into your camera club as well. Okay, so under Luminar, we'll just take a real quick look. I know that Baba had mentioned the roadmap. This is the next update developments that are coming out real soon. So you'll probably see this within a, a week or so. We have uh, plans throughout the year, including enhancing more of our Luminar libraries that Abba showed you. So you can look at Mac. <clears throat> here's Windows. We try to match Mac and Windows as best we can. And then here's a cloud also. So if you're interested in that roadmap, uh, we do have a lot of resources. If you want to learn more about Luminar, if you have any questions, we do have a really nice user guide where you can go in and learn everything from installation to system requirements to maybe what does a particular filter do? So you would just click on here and let's just look at the essential filters for a second in this AI filter. It'll explain exactly what that does as well as Sky Enhancer, et cetera. So those are all handy. We do have lots of videos uh, that are available. So just look under Luminar, under Learn More, Education, FAQs, and we have a technical support department that's happy to help if needed. So that's just a quick overview of what our website does. Thank you so much. This is well, really neat. Well, our pleasure. Thank you so much for letting us into your club tonight and, uh, and letting us share Luminar. We really appreciate that opportunity.